Good afternoon and welcome to this seminar uh, run by the Institute of International and European Affairs and you're all very welcome, particularly anybody who's new to our audience. We apologise for a slight delay in getting started, but I know we're going to have a really interesting session. We're delighted to be joined today by Odile Renard Basso, President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD, who has given her time today and is speaking about a topic that is so relevant to us all at the moment. The title is Perseverance and Resilience, Rebuilding Ukraine. President ba Reno Basso Odile will, will assess how the international community and international financial institutions can support Ukraine as we know Ireland is doing, and will also outline the EBRD's response to the Russian invasion, as well as the role that the bank can play in rebuilding. Now, President uh, Reno Basso, whom I refer to as Odile, if that's all right, uh, has a very impressive CV. i just give you a little idea of that. Is she was elected the seventh president of the EBRD on the 2nd of November 2020 by the Board of Governors, and she is the first ever female head of a multilateral development bank. Prior to joining the EBRD as Director General at the French Treasury, Odile oversaw the development of France's economic policies leading on European and international affairs, trade policies, financial regulation and debt management. And of course, in this capacity, she also served as Vice President of the European Economic and Financial Committee, Deputy to the G7, G20 groups and French Governor or Alternative Governor of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and she was also chair of the Paris Club. Now, Odile will speak to us for about 20 minutes. I'll say to our audience, you can put in your questions using the Q&A button on your, on your screen. The, the uh, function is on the record, as will the questions be. And also we'd like you to use the tweet, if you're still using tweet, at IIEA. And um, we, we can then proceed with, with um, uh, uh, Odile. So Odile, I'll let you uh, go ahead now, if you don't mind, and then we will have time at the end for questions. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Nora. And uh, thank you uh, for the um, Institute for International and European Affairs to have invited me to, to talk about this issue, which is indeed very important and very important also for the EBRD uh, as such. So um, this war on Ukraine and its people is really, I believe, a human and geopolitical catastrophe, which really strikes at the heart of Europe. And um, I'm very happy to address you on the response of international financial institutions like EBRD um, and, and what we can do, what, are, what we are doing and how I see um, the challenges moving forward. But before moving into that issue, let just a few words maybe on, on the EBRD as such. Um, you know, it was a bank which was created 30 years ago uh, when uh, at the time Soviet Union collapsed uh, to facilitate the transition to open market economies in the former Soviet countries, so Central Europe and Russia. And progressively, the bank expanded its mandate to cover 38 countries, both within the EU, so I mean, former um, communist countries, uh, Eastern European countries, but also outside from the I mean, Eastern 2000 neighborhood, Western Balkans, Central Asia, and Mongolia. So today we intervene in 38 countries, uh, soon 39 with Algeria joining us, um, being in the process of joining us. And we invest uh, around um, 10 billion, 11 billion a year between the, I mean, around this order of range of investment. We have 71 shareholders, uh, including, and uh, we are at the same time, I mean, European majority institution with a commission, EU Commission, EIB being part of our members and all EU member states. So altogether, they have a majority of the shareholders of the bank and also a G7 majority. If you add up all G7 countries, they also have a majority. So in a way, we are... A, multilateral development bank with a strong EU backbone or strong EU component. And we work very closely with the EU Commission as part of, as one of the implementing partner of um, EU priorities, part of Team Europe also. 
one of our specific features compared with other MDB is to have a very strong private sector mandate. So our objective is to have 75% of our investment in the private sector. We can do 25% in the public sector, and we work a lot on municipalities, sub-sovereign, public owned companies and, and so forth. And we bring together financing, but also policy engagement. So uh, sort of a lot of policy advisory activities to help our countries of operation design the right policy framework so as, so as to facilitate private sector investment. And uh, one of our key priorities in that respect, I will not have the opportunity to talk too much about it. So let me flag that at the beginning also, because we are, I mean, I'm coming back from COP and we are still in the COP process. We have a very strong green objective with 50% of our financing to be in the green sector. Um, and um, an objective also to starting at the, in January 2023 to be to have all our investment consistent with a Paris Agreement, so a fully Paris aligned at the beginning of this year. Um, so maybe now focusing a bit more on Ukraine, which is a, a key item of today. So Ukraine was part of the, I mean, EBRD mandate um, and EBRD countries of operation since the beginning. And we've been key partner in, uh, of the country in the last three decades, um, the largest institutional investor. Uh, and since uh, we started our activity in the country, we invested more than 16 billion uh, euros in more than 500 projects. Before the war started, Ukraine was our third country of operation in terms of volume beyond a bit, uh, a bit below um, Turkey and uh, Egypt. And we, have, we had a strong team in Kiev with 100 people in the ground, Kiev, but we're also, we were also present in Kharkiv, Lviv and Odessa. So uh, a strong local presence, and this is also one feature of the EBRD, more than 100 people in the country and not working not only in the capital, but also in uh, um, smaller cities in order to work with SMEs and um, in particular. With our work in the country, we have consistently supported hand-in-hand uh, -hand the EU Reform agenda, for example, to tackle uh, corruption, foster good, go good governance, which is absolutely key to be able to develop the private, uh, private and, and, and dynamic uh, private sector. Um, we have also worked a lot in the financial sector to make it more resilient. We uh, post Maidan, post 2014, there were a lot of difficulties in the banking sector, so we contributed a lot to clean up the banking sector. And one also of our um, important involvement in the country was uh, following Chernobyl to build a shelter around uh, the uh, nuclear plant of Chernobyl to ensure nuclear safety in the, in the neighborhood and uh, following the destruction of reactor four. So this is really to flag, I mean, our long-standing activity in Ukraine. So when the war started um, uh, in, on February uh, 2022, we took a very clear stance towards Russia and Belarus. Both are shareholders of the bank, and we used to have a very large, very dynamic activity in Russia, which already stopped in 2014, all our financing to Russia. Uh, and at that point of time, it was at some point of time, it was 3 billion a year investment in Russia. So we stopped it um, completely in 2019. But um, in 2022, February 2022, we formally suspended, we took a decision with all our shareholders, supported by two thirds of our, more than two thirds of our shareholders, to formally suspend all our new financing and existing financing uh, to Russia. So suspension of access to the bank's resources to Russia and Belarus and closed our office in Moscow and Minsk and very accelerating winding down of our portfolio in the two countries. Um, on the other side, so this, that, that was the decision taken uh, in reaction against, I mean, Russia and Belarus in reaction of the war. Um, on the other hand, since the war started, we never stopped our activity in Ukraine, directing fi finance and assistance to the areas more needed. 
most needed. So we continue our activity in Ukraine and even increased the level of investment in Ukraine this year, focusing on um, the real economy and what is needed to keep the economy afloat. And this means, for example, trade finance. We do a lot of trade financing, you know, short-term trade financing, which is very, very important to keep uh, important export going on, and and uh, and for that the banks need some guarantees which we provide. Vital uh, infrastructure, and this is uh, um, and we provide a lot of support to the railway company um, and the electricity network company Ukrainergo, um, as well as the gas company, in order to ensure energy security, we provide a sort of credit line of 300 million to buy to help help Nafto Gas to buy gas, and it will be brought up, bring up to uh, 200, uh, 500 million in the coming weeks. But also support to food security and pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies. Um, and in food, food security, we work a lot with the banking sector to risk to share risk with them, cover them with some of the credits they provide to uh, agribusiness companies or provide ourselves direct financing to agribusiness companies. So this is very, um, this complement, we see that as very complementary to uh, the budget support, which have been provided by um, the, a lot of bilateral donors through the World Bank in particular, but also through the IMF in order to finance, uh, you know, current expenditure in the government, such as, uh, I mean, pension financing, I mean, pension uh, um, to pay the pension, to pay the civil servants, minimum uh, needs for the government. So we are very complementary to that, focusing on, the, as I was saying, the real economy and um, and uh, private sector and key infrastructure. And we have been adjust, adjusted our financial, adjusting our financial support to the development very recently, for example, in view of what happened with the most recent bombing in the last months by Russia on, of key infrastructure, we are just expanding financing to the um, electricity network company, Ukraine Ergo, of new loan of 300 million euros in order to help them financing this um, urgent repair they need in order to avoid the country to go completely in a sort of, in the form of blackout. Uh, and this was decided uh, just after a visit um, I, I did in Kiev three weeks ago, where we met uh, President Zelensky and our key uh, counterparts in the country, and we realized how deeply needed was to have this sort of flexibility and very urgent financing to provide, uh, to be, to help the companies and, and the government to face with this uh, emergency repair needs. So, and we've been able to do that, um, I think in, in March, April last year, we decided um, to to continue to, to support Ukraine with an approach which is very well, was very specific at that point of time from EBRD, which is to take to accept to take further risk on our balance sheet, but uh, subject to get some risk sharing from our donors and shareholders with a, an approach based on 50-50. So we took we we considered that we could take some 50% of a risk on our balance sheet, but needed 50% of donor support or guarantees in order to, to mitigate the risk. Because of course, when you expand, when you expand your activity in a country in war, in a war zone, you never know whether what you finance will not be bombed the week after, or whether your client will be able to repay you because it will be suffering uh, I mean, huge damages um, in relation to the war. So we decided to take part of a risk, but to ask for mitigation uh, from um, our shareholders. And um, we committed uh, to deliver up to 3 billion euros of financing in 2022 and 2023. So for the two years with a 50% donor coverage. Up to now, with the different activities I described you, we were, we, it's very likely that we will reach around 1.5 already in 2022 of financing, maybe more, even maybe even a bit more, but, and then we will continue to do this uh, next year. 
the approach we've, ta we've taken was quite unique as I was referring to uh, among M other MDBs. I think the other MDBs um, decided first to um, ask for full coverage of their activities. IFC is now moving uh, the same approach than us, but, uh, but um, for the other MDBs, it's not really the case. And particularly the World Bank, they consider that they cannot more, take more risks. So what they do is fully, fully financed by uh, donor support. Um, and I, the, the, what we've been able to do would never have been possible without uh, the, level, the support of our shareholders. Uh, when we announced our approach, the US were the first one uh, committing in the package they presented to Congress to provide us with 500 million of grants in order to uh, co cover, um, to help us with the coverage of our activities. And then the EU was able, the Commission was able to reallocate some of its guarantees and and we got a lot of support also from bilateral uh, European member states um, with unfunded guarantees or funded guarantees. So helping us with uh, uh, covering, coveraging the risk for targeting uh, targeted transactions. So this was very unique. Up to now, we've raised uh, something like 1.3, 1.4 donor support, which is absolutely unique uh, for EBRD and uh, has really helped us to announce this 3 billion package for the, for the two years. So what I can say is that um, the, in the international response, it was a bit, um, I mean, adjusting to the emergency, so not completely uh, orderly. I mean, and, and, I mean, everybody, every country is trying to find solution uh, in the short term, uh, but I've never seen, to be frank, such a high level of support for countries in a crisis. Huh? And, and uh, in, in such a, of course, it's a very exceptional crisis with a war situation, very I mean, uh, sort of um, uh, incredible challenge for the country. But I think the level of support um, from EU, US, Canada, and, and in the broad international, international community has been huge. It's true from the level of support we've received on our side, but it was also complemented by a very high level of budget support uh, from um, um, US and the EU, which uh, help because the needs are uh, absolutely huge in terms of budget support. They have been assessed to something like 3 billion per month uh, by the country and uh, confirmed this level this figure have been confirmed by IMF. And uh, I think G7 as a whole has been able more or less to meet the need for 2022. And uh, now US and the EU are working to secure and uh, ensure some, I mean, additional previsibility and regularity in the financing for 2023. And I think the EU has been reaching, I mean, it's very close or has reached um, an agreement on a kind of mechanism uh, with using the same frameworks and the RRF in order to be able to deliver this kind of support for Ukraine uh, for the next year. So I think this is a very important uh, step forward. And it has been a bit complex, but I think things are moving now quite quickly. So I, that brings me to the second part of, of my um, presentation, which is a, a bit focusing on the, the role of international community and, and the framework for cooperation. Um, as I was saying, external support is absolutely fundamental for the country to be able to, su to sustain the war. Uh, there has been a lot of military support coming from, um, from the US, from the UK, from uh, EU, from EU member states. But as I was underlying, the budget support and financial support for the real economy is also very important because if you want the country to be able to get, I mean, to, to remain resilient and be able to, to fight, uh, it's very important to, to get appropriate support. I think we were all amazed. I mean, and all the international community has been, uh, I mean, amazed and, and, and impressed by the resilience of the country, both on the military side, but also on the economic side. But this, is not, this would not have been possible without um, support. So there have been also a lot of discussion on how to better Organ, uh, get organized because uh, you have all these um, donors contribution, but also um, um, 
international organization intervening and I think getting a, a better, more structured coordination will be very important now and for the reconstruction phase. You may have noticed that President Zelensky has called for a financial Ramstein, which is the, this structure of the Ramstein coordination has been used for military purposes uh, around NATO. And I think that we are trying to build the objective of Ukraine and, and key inter, uh, international partner is to develop the same kind of, same kind of framework for economic and financial support. Uh, and we really believe that indeed that there is a, a need for a more formal coordination uh, platform, um, inclusive, an inclusive platform uh, bringing together all, I mean, Ukraine and all key partners, uh, so bilateral donors such as the US, G7, the EU, um, all key donors and in international financial institutions. And I think that the political steering committee at the ministerial level could be very useful to provide high level guidance and support to ensure that the financial needs are they are assessed, for example, by the IMF, um, will be are met and that uh, you know, provide also some transparency and accountability on the commitments taken and the disbursement uh, made. In this respect, the um, IMF is now working on the sort of board monitor program, which will give a macroeconomic framework for all this activity. They are working with the Ukrainian. This should come to the board uh, by the end of the year. It's not a program, um, but it's a, uh, it's a board monitor program, so more giving them framework, the transparency on the financial and economic situation, budgetary situation, assessment of the financing needs, and will be an important pillar of this discussion uh, in terms of coordination. Um, it will be allowing everybody to have a better understanding of what is needed, what is already covered, what, what is the remaining gap. Then under this sort of policy, I mean, political platform uh, at ministerial level, we believe that there is a need for a more structured IFI, um, EU Commission coordination platform. We already have an existing group, coordination group, which we convened as EBRD uh, since the beginning of the war and which brings together IMF, EIB, World Bank, IFC, um, the Bank of the, the European Bank of the, um, I mean, the Bank for the European Council of Europe and um, the Commission. This group has been meeting every two weeks since the beginning of the war and has been very useful in understanding what was the priority for the different institutions, what was the financing um, contribution, the state of commitment, disbursement, and so forth. Now we believe it's important to, in, to be more inclusive and to include Ukraine and also key donors in this group and uh, to uh, develop a sort of bit of a secretariat. So that's our contribution. And I think it will be very important to have these two level, more political level of coordination and then operational level of uh, coordination. It's also, in my take is that, uh, rather than trying because in this kind of situation you always have some a lot of ideas new ideas possible creation of new institution i really believe that what we need more is building on existing institution and ensure that they are working together and uh, in order to be able to deliver quickly and i also believe that there will be no I mean, we, will not, we are not in a world where we are in a war and suddenly come to a reconstruction phase, but it's very, what is most likely is a, a sort of progressive and already now in the ongoing war, there are some reconstruction needs. And so we, we need to, add, to be able to address them even if we are not in a sort of very stable environment where we can start in a peaceful reconstruction, very ambition planning and so forth. So I think it's very important to focus on what can be done now. The more we can provide support at the current juncture, the better, the easier the reconstruction will be. And uh, we need to get prepared for full-fledged reconstruction, but also deliver on the ground now. So I think that's why um, building on the existing structure and strengthening existing coordination mechanism is the best way forward at the current juncture. Um, 
Moving a bit towards, I mean, what reconstruction will entail, uh, let me say a few words. First of all, the needs will be very, very important. Um, and the World Bank has made an assessment, a preliminary assessment, which, which was uh, something like 350 billion. But it's, it was, I mean, even it was, this figure was um, articulated before the very recent um, um, new and very intense attack on uh, key infrastructure networks. So I think this would be a very evolving data and, and it's an area where things uh, get uh, um, uh, get outdated very quickly so um, we need to remain uh, very agile and adjust to the reality the evolving reality uh, on the ground uh, but that's so this is your, it gives an order of magnitude of what will be needed. And in the very short term, uh, the World Bank assessment, and there also before the recent uh, intensification of the attacks, was already 17 billion for end of 2020, uh, 2022 and 2023. Um, so huge needs. Um, this means that um, it will not be, it cannot be covered only by uh, public financing, but private uh, financing, domestic investment and attracting FDI will be key in the to bridge the financing gap and in the reconstruction phase. This means that we need to focus on two preconditions. The first one is um, the fact that IFI and donor community must support both public and private sectors, including uh, state-owned enterprise for the immediate recovery to maintain the well-functioning of the economy and for longer-term reconstruction. And this also requires the IFIs, of course, to find a sustainable financing model given the high level of risk. The second precondition will be to maintain the macro financial stability in the country uh, to actually be able to support private sector development. And that's why this program, monitor, uh, board monitor program will be very, it will be a very important step. It will be an important anchor, uh, will limit and will frame, I mean, avoid uh, to completely uh, go into monetary financing, which would trigger hyperinflation and so forth and will be very damaging, damaging for um, private sector financing of the reconstruction. In addition, it's vital to strengthen uh, financial and capital markets. And one important dimension in this respect will be um, EU financial regulatory alignment. We are working a lot on that with uh, um, Commissioner McGuinness and I mean, and EBRD providing support to Ukrainian authorities. And also promoting effective banking system through, for example, NPL resolution, possibly for before reconstruction and recapitalization of local banks. And this will complement IMF macro, fin, macro fiscal framework. Last point, but not least, it will be, I mean, the work on human capital is also very important and crucial. And even now, this is an area we are, we are focusing on in the support we provide to clients, for example. We also bring into uh, the discussion this human capital uh, dimension, which is very much needed workforce such, with um, items such as workforce planning, when companies are struggling with very high staff turnover, relocation, um, and the need, for example, to reskill, upskill existing staff, um, and include the gender dimension. So this is something we are already taking into consideration in the work we are doing with our clients, and it will be even more important in the context of the reconstruction. Last point I wanted to make in the, I mean, on the discussion in the reconstruction is the, the reform agenda, because um, as I was flagging, it was a very important dimension in our work in Ukraine before the war. And um, there was some progress made, but of course the country still had some important challenges in terms of corruption, rule of law, governance in the public sector, but also, um, I mean, in the, in the, so, I mean, the public companies and so forth. With the war, this very important structural agenda, I mean, is, is, doesn't attract so much attention and the, the capacity for the government to do, to continue to do some reform is limited. So what we are focusing in now, on now is ensuring that there is no backtracking and that's some key features of the reform 
implemented are preserved and that of course the money and the investment we do are well managed and and uh, and uh, i mean we have sufficient guarantee and comfort about the use of proceeds but when recovery and and when the situation will be stabilized returning back to reform will be very important and in that respect i think one very important new element is um, eu prospects and eu accession um, perspective and um, it's very clear from my perspective that eu um, uh, integration process will be a key anchor for reform um, in the coming years uh, it will and it will help i think driving the reform agenda on the ukrainian side because uh, bringing the acquis communautaire in Ukraine will, will be a huge step forward. So I think that it's already very important that uh, Ukraine's national recovery plan already identified strengthening institutional capacity, the oligarchization as a prerequisite of this reform agenda, also with the need to tackle corruption, but moving forward, building an enabling business environment, attracting foreign direct investment will require um, to deepen this agenda to create a full-fledged level, I mean, true level playing field to foster competition and, and so forth. So this is a full-fledged transformatory, I mean, transformation agenda that will need to be, to go hand in hand with the financing uh, for reconstruction. So I will um, conclude here, I mean, just highlighting our very strong commitment to continue to support Ukraine, to work hand in hand with our shareholders and donors to find the best way to do so, to be able to do so without um, undermining our financial solidity as a bank. Uh, but I think that up to now, we've been able to find the right balance and we continue to deepen the discussion with, uh, uh, with the shareholders. And I think that everything we can do in the country is absolutely uh, key for them to be able to sustain and uh, um, and to win to get out of the war stronger and and better thank you very much I